This is a talk on giving a talk, and we're doing this because so many of you will be giving talks as either students or faculty, and yet in the course of our, of our education, very few people actually teach us how to do this. They just say, well, if you have the information, you stand up and you give a talk, and yet the, I believe that there are certain guidelines that we can follow that anyone, anyone can learn how to give a talk and do a very good job of it if you follow certain principles. Now, this is not based on a, res on a uh, review of the literature, but rather on my own experience in teaching for 35, 40 years. So I'm, it, it's really an experiential discussion rather than a review of the literature and looking at different things. So let's, uh, uh, let's proceed uh, uh, with it. Now, I'm going to talk about content, about organization, the presentation of the talk, and then I'm going to spend a fair amount of time on audiovisual aids, and then answering questions, and then I have a short piece on posters as well. So, what is it about content that we have to know about? Well, first of all, as a, uh, uh, in giving a talk, either to a class or a scientific uh, gathering, we want to know who's the audience. What are their expectations? How many people are going to be there? Uh, what is their previous knowledge on the subject? What are their expectations? Um, how much time is available? 15 minutes? I was just at a symposium the other day. Each speaker had six minutes. Well you then have to uh, orient your talk accordingly, otherwise you're just doing your introduction and the time is up. Are there other speakers? And if so, what is the content of their presentation? How many times do we go to meetings where there's a panel of four people and the first three people give their talks and the last person says, oh, well, they've all said what I was going to say, but I'm going to say it again. Don't get yourself in that position. If you're on a panel and there are others on the panel, others on the speaker, find out what it is that they're saying so that you can blend your talk in with theirs or that you're not showing the same slides and so on. How many points can you cover? I say three or four maximum. And I don't care whether the talk is three minutes or three hours. If you can cover three, three points in a talk, you've done a very, very good job. Next, the organization. <clears throat> My mantra is very simple. I tell people what I'm going to tell them, and then I tell them, and then I tell them what I told them. <laughs> so I started out, as you recall, by saying, here's, here's the outline of my talk. This is now the body of the talk. And in the last 15 seconds, I will summarize. The reason that I find this helpful is it forces me to think about what is the organization. Because if I am unclear, then it's going to be unclear to the audience. Now the presentation. You need to know the size of the room. The first time that you give the talk, uh, when you first give the talk, and you go to the room that you're speaking in, classroom, lecture room, that should not be the first time you've been there. You should have seen it already. You should know where do people sit. Now, clearly I had you move to this side because the way this is set up, we're going to use this screen. It would be somewhat embarrassing for me to sit over here and talk and then you look at that screen. So we set it up this way. Check the sound and the light system. I came here a half hour earlier. We looked at the sound system. Should I wear something here? Should I use the microphone? The uh, portable uh, microphone wasn't working, so I use this. But don't do it just two minutes before you arrive, okay? Because if something go, can go wrong, it will go wrong. Speak slowly and clearly to the audience, not to the screen. Now you notice I've not turned to look at the screen because whatever is in my computer is on the screen. They're not going to trick me and have a different set of slides here than the one here. Now, why is this important? Because if I turn and speak to the screen, 
PowerPoint for that. Because then you'll be clear. What is it in this table that I want people to see? And you'll get rid of the other stuff. Uh, pictures can be useful, but generally it should be one message per picture. So let me try to give you some examples of what I'm talking about. Before I do that, I should also note that the text should be readable in the very last row. They paid the same amount of money to come here as you did in the front row. So they should be able to see it. That's why I say a font of about 28 or greater is what you should use. I would say aim for about 28, if, unless you feel this is too large, but 24 I would never go be, I would never make it smaller than that. And, it, and again, it depends on the size of the hall. If it's a deep, deep hall, you're going to need larger text. This will prevent you from trying to cram too much information. I like RAL, Times New Roman. You can use whatever you want, but make it straightforward and simple. The message is what's important here. Avoid cluttering the slide with unnecessary information. Every piece of information here should be of some use. If it's not, then get rid of it. Because people will start reading things, and if there's stuff there that's not useful, then, then what do they do with it? So here's some slides that should not, should not be used. Can you read that? Well, of course you can't read it. Then why, if you can't read it, then why am I showing it to you? Here we have a very nice uh, demonstration of the uh, nurses leaving the Philippines. But the title is in yellow, which you cannot read. And why is all that text around there? That text is of no value. So this was taken directly out of a book. Okay, So the presenter here could have cut out the table and just shown us that. Instead, we can't read the numbers, we can't read the table. So this is, to me, lazy presentation. Either make a new slide or edit this one so that the only information that's there is what is going to be used. People are not going to read this text. Here's another one, a sample survey of national workforce patterns. And each of these little boxes represents nurses and doctors and so on. But why are there five on there? Maybe you could put one on a slide, and then you can contrast it with one other one. Maybe two, but this is again unreadable. So here is polio incidents by month in India from 1994 to 1998. I want to show you the importance of national immunization days. Okay, now I have to turn to the slide. On the vertical axis is thousands of cases from two all the way to 120. Here is the year divided by months. So you can see in 1994 there was an incidence, uh, there were almost 115,000 cases. In 1995 this came down to about half that amount. At the end of 1995 and the beginning of 1996 there were NIDs. NIDs are National Immunization Days. And you can say, see, after these occurred, in 1996, the number of cases came down dramatically. Now, to be sure that this just wasn't standard epidemiology, these NIDs were done again at the end of 96 and 97, and 97 and 98, and you can see that the number of cases have remained low. Now, that slide took about 30 seconds. 35 seconds. But I had to do it because you need to say what is the vertical, what is the horizontal. You need to explain to the people. Now here's a slide that some would say is too complicated. This is a slide that links wildlife EID stands for emerging infectious diseases, domestic animals, and humans. And these show the linkages within a group or between groups. So let's take one of these groups, that is the relationship between wildlife, emerging infections, and domestic animals. That's represented here, and then I go through and I explain each of those. 
I have not tried to take on the whole slide. I could spend a whole lecture just on this slide, but I have to have the time then to explain what is encroachment, what is spillover, what is spillback. Okay? So each of these terms, again, depending on the audience, will need an explanation. Here's the use of photos and pictures. Now this is very clear. This is a female, 80s Egypti, and how do we know? Well, in 80s Egypti, you can see the banding on the legs. It is only the female that takes a blood meal, but it's, it could be used in the discussion of malaria, for example. In a talk that I gave on plague, where I was linking the rat to the flea that lives on the rat, to the bacteria, and I showed the whole linkage. Here is a picture of Rattus ratus, the brown rat. Here's a picture of the flea that lives on the rat. And here is a picture of the bacteria, Yersinia pestis, which looks a bit like a safety pin. But in the discussion, each of these pictures has a particular, it's one picture of one thing. What is this a picture of? What disease am I talking about here? SARS. You notice, why SARS? Well, there are a lot of Chinese girls all wearing masks. But here's a picture, as they say, that's worth a thousand words. Okay? So I'm now going to talk about SARS. Up goes the picture. And first of all, it's, it's easy to recognize. You don't need a lot of explanation. So I say to you, what is this disease? Most of you said SARS. Now, lots of people like to put text and pictures on the same slide. I'm not sure why this is the case. Uh, and the problem that you run into this is that you can. This is about how did Nipah transmit between pigs. So on, the, on your left is the explanation. But you are forced to use smaller text because half the slide is taken up by the picture. Why not do it this way? And then this, as opposed to this. So here now, the text is much easier to read. And I can then say, well, they moved the pigs around. There was a pig trade. They sold sick pigs in, in other markets. Here's an example of a pig being transported to market. So I get the same information in, and the picture is much clearer. Now here's another example. Hospital costs and treating the elderly after the fall. So on the picture on the left are some statistics. Now the problem is, and this is taken from a photograph, it's fuzzy, it's small, and you have the picture of the man walking down the hall. I'm not sure why you need that, but if you want to make that bigger, you can. But why not take that information and put it in this form? And then show a person coming down the hall. But the information in this table is not readable. If it's not readable, then don't show it. Now let's come to the last issue, that of answering questions. People always say, oh my God, do I have to answer questions? Well, you may have to. So how do you go about doing it? Now remember, the person up here is the, the authority. You're the expert by the very virtue that I'm here and you've come to hear me. So when I take questions and I say, are there questions? There are many ways of addressing it. My feeling is that, first of all, lecturing is a performance art. So the actor in a theater doesn't just act for this side of the, of the audience or for this side of the audience. The actor is acting for everybody. And they want everybody to join in this production. So when I ask for questions, I take them from the back and the front, from the right, from the left. I move it around. If I say, let's start here and go around to this side, the only thing the folks over here are interested in is please don't ask the question that I want to ask. They're not listening. They're waiting, hoping that their question won't be asked. But if I start here, and then I go there, and then I come up here, everybody feels that they're a part of the, of the action, part of the process. 
it's oftentimes good to repeat the question. So, the question is, da 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 and then you answer. Now, when you answer the question, don't just answer to the person who asked the question. Because then you get into a dialogue with this person, and the rest of the audience is cut out of the process. Say, thank you very much, and then you address everybody. Because she may be very hostile to me. She may not want me to be up here. She may be want, want to be up here. And so she's going to get into a uh, thank you for the question, and then I ask everybody. She may have a follow-up. We'll see. But address the entire audience. Don't get into individual debates. Make sure, by the way, that you set the ground rules early. Or if there's a moderator, the most important person in a panel, for example, is the moderator. Because the moderator then says, should say, we'll open the floor to questions. Please phrase your, uh, don't make statements, but rather give this, the question. Because some people like to, and I'll show you, for example, in this picture here, you can see the moderator saying, now let's open the floor to shorter speeches designed, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, disguised as questions. So somebody says, I really want to give the speech, so they start the question, and it's not a question at all, but it's a talk. Mm -hmm. Now, if the moderator has said, or you have said, please phrase it as a question, after about a minute you can say, and the question is? And what, what is the question? Without being impolite. Don't ever criticize uh, the person asking the question. You're not a bigger person by saying, well, you know, if you hadn't been sleeping when I gave the talk, you wouldn't have asked such a stupid question. That, that, first of all, you need not do that. If it's a question that's quite obvious that the person wasn't around or something, you can say, well, thank you. I think I may have dressed that in the talk, but uh, please come up and see me afterwards if you have. But, but never belittle another person. There's no point of that. Uh, uh, be above that sort of thing. You can consider written questions. If there are a thousand people in the audience, you can say, please write the questions and we'll select some from that list. Um, please understand it's all right not to know. Thank you for that question. I'm sorry, but I really I don't have information on it. Now, some people will turn to the audience and say, is anybody here want to address it? Be careful, because you are then turning over the control to somebody else who may decide to give another speech. So you say, well, thank you for that. I'm sorry, I don't know, but maybe we can discuss it afterwards. Come see me afterwards, so on. Or if you have a good friend there that knows, you could say, you know, Bill here is an expert on that. You could do that sort of thing. Sometimes you can actually use the audience as a little trick. If you don't have enough time to present, you could have a plant in the audience. You can say, yes, please. And that person is already uh, programmed to ask you the question that allows you to expand on the talk that you give. But that's a little technique that you can use uh, sometimes. Be prepared. If you're prepared, then you're, you're better off. If you're unprepared, you're going to have a lot of time saying, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. But if you're prepared, the better prepared you are, the more likely you are to be able to address uh, the question. So what I've tried to do in this brief time, I think we spent about 20, 25 minutes on this, is to go over the elements of a talk, the content of the talk, uh, the outline, the presentation of the talk, use of audiovisual aids, question period, and so on. I believe, and my experience has certainly taught me this with former students and others, that if you follow a simple set of guidelines, these are the ones that I use, you can follow others, that anyone can give a good talk. You don't have to have a golden voice and a particularly charismatic character. What you have to have is an organizational sense of what it is that you want to say it and then say it in a clear way. Uh, evidently, there is research now that indicates that uh, even in, uh, in these uh, online teaching things and so on, that basically they're now breaking these talks into what they call chunks, 15 minute 
15 minute uh, discussions of a particular area. Because if you try to go too long, so you need a break in there, either with certain slides or a case or something. But if you try to can go straight through for an hour, you're going to lose a lot of people along the way. So this idea of chunks is now coming into the, uh, into the uh, sort of uh, dialogue or discussion of giving a talk. Let me ask, are there any questions on anything that I've talked about?